Hello and welcome to the 15th Singapore Connect COVID-19 Forum. For those of you joining us for the first time, Singapore Connect is a San Francisco Bay Area-based volunteer-run overseas Singaporean group, which was started about 20 years ago. Since March 15th this year, Singapore Connect has been facilitating these community updates on the evolving COVID-19 situation in partnership with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Singapore Global Network. We've also had special guest subject matter experts from our community. In our previous sessions, we've addressed the impact of COVID-19 on personal and professional topics like COVID-19 prevention, the search for the COVID-19 cure, mental health during shelter-in-place, the U.S.-Singapore visa situation, job opportunities in Singapore, education, Singaporean Bay Area restaurants, as well as cooking Singapore food at home. Today, in our 15th session, we will be featuring Dr. Jameis Lim, Professor of Economics at Essex Business School. Jameis actually needs no introduction to many of us here in the Bay Area, given that he spent a number of years here. Welcome, Jameis, and thanks for joining us today. Um, the economic, an economic update, right, on what the implications are uh, given this COVID situation. So we've been uh, really uh, fortunate to have with us Dr. Jameis Lim join us this evening, and he's a professor of economics at Essex Business School, one of Europe's leading business schools. Jameis actually needs no introduction to many of us here because he spent a number of years in the Bay Area. Um, but he is, he's certainly an economics professor and a member of the 14th Parliament of Singapore representing Sing Kang. Uh, he has spent much of his career as an economist, uh, as you see here, at Third Rock, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, as well as at the World Bank. Um, and he was an alum of a Raffles Institution. He's also studied in Australia, studied in London, um, here in California, as well as Harvard. So he spent a lot of time everywhere. And I love, I love his list of hobbies, certainly a man of many talents, including music. We could have used your talent um, in our video, Jameis. <laughs> we didn't have a drummer. Um, and then, of course, rugby, solitaire, and now he's cooking as well. So maybe we could have a cooking show with Jameis paired with wine pairings, it looks like. So, Jameis, we're so glad to have you here today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Jess. And, thanks. And, and thanks, Mark. Um, so, uh, again, as Jess shared, I, I was at some point, I spent five of the best years of my life in the Bay Area, and it really breaks my heart to see what's happening there, and especially with, with one of the epicenters uh, of the fire in Santa Cruz, it's uh, definitely, uh, you know, I just, I, I still have good friends uh, that live in the area and I, I just had a conversation with my best friend this morning and he said, maybe the only one saving grace is that they had fog that came in and so that, that kind, kind of uh, provides some dampness at least that, that may arrest some of the, the wildfires on that front. But I mean, the, the Santa Cruz fires, as far as I understand, is uh, probably among the most populated. Uh, it is burning in, in, in of the three major conflagrations, that's the, the one that is uh, the most populated corridor. So uh, again, stay safe and uh, hopefully um, things will blow over soon. Maybe well, blow thanks, away Venus. is the best word for wildfire. I know, it's yeah. a tough situation, but thanks, thanks for that. Okay, so um, I'm gonna, yeah, share my screen. I, I see you share a screen. Should I drive or do you wanna drive? You can drive it, that's easier. So let's do that. Let me do that. Perfect, it's coming across, thank you. Yeah, great. So um, so thank you for the invitation once again. Uh, Mark and I actually went to school together, so this is a, a bit of a reunion of sorts. That's the, the little bit of connection for why I'm speaking to you, other than the fact that, of course, uh, it's really um, a, the connection to you guys and feeling, knowing where you guys uh, came from. Um, having been an expat in the Bay Area myself. So uh, I'm, I'm gonna take a bit more of a broader global look and just very quickly, just to update uh, you on where we stand at the global, in terms of the global picture. And you, you'll see that a lot of this, uh, Jess has already mentioned, you know, as, as you may know, the, at, in terms of the global distribution of cases, um, it does seem like the world is entering into a second wave. Some people say that it's not quite the second wave because we never exited that first wave. 
But I think just looking at the ascending trend uh, ever since the middle of the year, you'll see basically that we are uh, pretty much in the second phase. But importantly, uh, there's a lot of cross-country heterogeneity. Of course, uh, having um, started it first in East Asia, East Asia te tends to be further along, uh, followed by the other developed markets. And really, uh, where most of this wave is concentrated in is in Latin America, uh, especially Brazil and Mexico, which is uh, a reminder of the importance of uh, leadership that is actually focused on uh, recognizing and, and operating uh, in accordance to the science, right? Because of course, uh, Brazil and Mexico in principle have uh, resources that uh, could be used to tackle that. But they're, they're in a difficult situation in part because uh, for them shutting down the economy is a non-trivial uh, implications since they are you know, middle income countries. Uh, it's not as easy to have large outlays to support the population like in advanced economies. Um, there is the fear, as, as you may know, that uh, the APEC region, although it has done better than others, um, it, there, there is always the ever-present risk of imported cases. Uh, Jess and, and Daryl, in fact, shared earlier on about how um, some of these uh, kind of green zones are, are gradually opening up in Singapore. And we, you know, of course, part of the reason why Singapore went through a mini second phase uh, was in part because of imported cases, right? Especially from Singaporeans returning home. So, so I think the government is extremely sensitive to the risks that that, that may entail. Now, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about uh, how policymakers have responded. I think many of you are familiar with a number of these things, but essentially, uh, from an economics perspective, uh, so if you think back, if you had economics classes before, you know that there are two important uh, drivers in economics. One is demand and the other is supply. And, and as it turns out, uh, the COVID-19 crisis uh, represented a simultaneous shock to both of these things. On the demand side, obviously, uh, most straightforwardly because there were sales restrictions, right? You, and basically, we shut the economy down uh, and you, a lot of retail sales was completely shuttered or had to move into a much lower volume online mode, for some of which uh, you know, especially small and medium enterprises may not have been fully prepared. Uh, and of course, on the consumer side, uh, a lot of reduced demand that comes from fear and uncertainty and reduced confidence. On the supply side, of course, uh, the initial bit was just about disruptions to supply chains, principally from China and what that meant. Uh, we'll talk in a bit about what that may mean for supply chain management into the future. Uh, but also uh, the, the most sensitive part of the business cycle, as it turns out, uh, is often in, in terms of capital expenditure, investment. And what, what this heightened uncertainty about future often means is that uh, investment contracts. And when you have an investment contraction, it's almost inevitably followed uh, by a, an economic contraction. And that's exactly what we saw. We, we, COVID-19 uh, was the trigger. Uh, of course, in and of itself, it may have led to a recession anyhow, uh, but I think many economies worldwide were already uh, in a weak recessionary window, if you will, uh, a period of weakness. And so uh, when you ha when, when faced with a sufficiently large shock such as COVID-19, it tipped many economies into an uh, outright recession. So the trade-off, as many of you may be aware, is just, you know, you, you could... You, you, you've seen the curves, the, the upper part of this panel here, right? Just the idea that you want to flatten the curve uh, so that the new cases do not end up overwhelming um, the, the medical system, the, 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 the um, healthcare system in the country. Now, of course, if you look at the areas on the curve, you realize that in principle, this doesn't mean that you have less cases overall. Uh, it just means that you allow an extended period of time for cases to be managed. But of course, the stricter your containment measures, uh, if you were to try to bend the curve, what often happens is that you will face um, a much larger GDP shock. And that means that it calls for more aggressive containment policies. Singapore uh, is among, globally we'll see, uh, is among the largest uh, uh, engage in some of the largest uh, fiscal expansions. So in fact, this, this chart is a little bit out of date. Singapore has in fact spent close to Japan, so about 20% of our GDP, uh, a large part of that funded by uh, reserves that were put aside for 
in previous gen by previous generations. And so we've had many, many packages. And in fact, it was just announced that we, we will now have a fifth package. This last package is, uh, I'll, I'll get to that, is, is a little different in that it kind of shifts away from um, policy that's focused on disaster uh, management and into recovery, and which is what we really want, right? We don't want to be always be in the process of engaging in crisis management. And then just the other thing that, that of course, uh, has occurred in this time is that globally, we have seen uh, policymakers, especially monetary policymakers, uh, slash interest rates. That wasn't, uh, the context is that, as you may know, there wasn't a lot of room to slash interest rates to begin with. Maybe as few economies like the United States did have a bit more room. But uh, historically, it was actually uh, a much narrower window. So now rates have been slashed to close to zero. But in previous business cycles, uh, the U.S. started that rate cut cycle um, at interest rates of closer to 5%, whereas now it started uh, just a little more than two and a half percent. So it's a, it, it definitely leaves less room for monetary policy to play its traditional stabilization role, not just in the US, but, but in many parts of the world. And here, uh, in some ways, um, in developing countries, which have maintained slightly higher rates, uh, actually have more room there. So you, I mean, I, I understand that this is a part of a series of, of COVID-19 seminars. So I'm not going to go over uh, the details to of, of all these budgets. Uh, but I, I mentioned earlier on, we are now into this kind of final budget, which we, which is, a, a, well, who knows if it's the final budget, let's hope it, it would be the final budget, but uh, we are in a recovery budget. And the immediate COVID-19 support has been scaled down, as just mentioned, and, and Daryl as well. Some of these expenditures are now targeted much more toward the most hard hit industries that look like they will continue to need help uh, but by and large, it's a transition away from the more direct, you know, I'm going to give you money because otherwise you're sitting at home and not working uh, into uh, something where it's trying to reboot the economy uh, much more consistent with what we usually see after an economy goes into a recession. Now, um, we'll touch on this later, but of course, uh, this is an, an unusual uh, event in that Typically, you know, one of the blessings that Singapore enjoys is that we uh, we don't have natural disasters, right? You know, not no earth, no, no wildfires, no earthquakes uh, and the like, no floods, tsunamis. And what that means is that usually we never need to deploy uh, this kind of crisis budgets, right? The few times that we did uh, was much more for financial crises. Uh, so, and, and that is a very well understood playbook. Uh, the pandemic crisis um, are, are much less well understood and, and certainly we have never had something like COVID-19 that has been as prolonged. Right? Contrast that to um, SARS in, where it, it did hit the economy pretty hard, but it was in a much more contracted time, compressed time period. It was pretty much one quarter. If you look at the full year numbers, it doesn't really even show up that much. Uh, whereas this case, COVID will definitely show up in the full year data. So what to expect? Well, uh, obviously forecasts are dangerous, especially about the future. Um, but uh, it's worth pointing out that uh, we, the world at large actually, uh, still remains in a contractionary mode. So this is industrial production. So these are the, uh, just the industry and manufacturing sectors of, of the world economy. And you can see the light blue lines are those uh, countries that are still, so it's a selected number of countries, right? Larger, advanced and developing countries. So the blue, light blue lines are uh, countries that are currently expanding and the dark blue lines are those where industrial production is contracting. And you can see there was already a shift uh, in this, um, in, in the beginning of 2018, right? So this is what I mean by uh, the world was already going through a period of weakness, relative weakness, which is why COVID-19 so easily tipped uh, economies into outright recession. And obviously where you see us now is that basically only one or two economies, principally uh, China is, is seeing expansion in industrial production. The rest of the world is still uh, in contraction mode. And if you look at the US, which is where you guys are, you'll see that uh, it faces large, largest uh, quarterly contraction uh, in, in recent history. Um, certainly since uh, the, the Great Depression. So 
the, the, these are scary numbers, but it's important to keep in mind the US reports these as uh, annualized numbers. So this is a contraction of 33% in the second quarter. Uh, if if you, these numbers were to hold for not just that quarter, but all the way into the future. Of course, we know that that's not going to be the case. So you won't see a full year contraction of a third of the economy in the US. So just in case you're worried about your jobs. Uh, but uh, even that recovery, as much as it will be a significant shock, what, what sometimes calls a V-shaped bounce back, uh, nevertheless will not make up for the full ground, right? So those. Uh, among us, uh, you're, you're all working in the Bay Area, I'm assuming most of you are quantitatively oriented. You'll know that a contraction of say, you know, 50% uh, is not fully made up by expansion of 50%, right? Uh, it's just the simple math of percentages. So in this case, even if the economy were to bounce back uh, by 33% into uh, the third and the fourth quarter, um, it won't fully make up for the lost ground. And uh, all indications are that at least uh, even in the third quarter where the recovery is expected to be the most robust, given that it's basically unleashing uh, the economy from its previous shackles, we are not seeing expectations of GDP in the third quarter to be much more than 20%. So these are what's sometimes called now cast. It's forecast of the current state of the economy, right? So this, um, again, we are only in August, uh, the third quarter ends uh, in September, but nevertheless, this gives you an indication uh, that the recovery, while uh, go certainly robust, is not going to make up for the lost ground that was lost in, in the second quarter. Now, so where you then have is this alphabet soup of possible recovery paths. You may have seen variations of this, this uh, story before, you know, either you have this Z-shaped recovery. Now, nobody really believes that this is a possibility, maybe some Republican circles. I know you're living in California, so you're probably insulated from, from that kind of a storyline. Um, the hope was, of course, a V-shaped recovery. It, uh, this is, you know, it's not unprecedented. Uh, in historical recessions, many economies, including those of the, the US economy has recovered uh, in this fashion. But um, unfortunately, it doesn't look like we are somewhere there. This could be the possibility, this U-shaped recovery of a very uh, extended period at the bottom, um, followed by an eventual pickup, but, but still very, very uh, slow pickup. And, and, and this, if, if anything, is the most likely recovery path, it seems, given the emerging data, right? So it's kind of a swoosh, uh, square root kind of recovery, but you do see a bounce. Uh, and, and that bounce we I've, I've just shown you uh, is most likely in the third quarter. But then after that initial bounce, it looks like because the economies worldwide, including the US were already uh, in a uh, recessionary window, it will go through the throes of a typical uh, recession. And, and at least based on the last recession, as well as the one before, uh, they were relatively prolonged affairs before the recovery was fully entrenched. And this is kind of a, what happens, the, the W-shaped recovery is what would happen if you did have a second wave, which re required a second shutdown. Hopefully, uh, we won't be that in that situation or this L-shaped recovery where we never recover at all, well, ever. Um, you know, people, uh, often ask what does this mean for financial markets and why is it that the stock markets uh, appear to be um, defying gravity, if you will. Uh, it's important to keep a few things in mind. Stock markets uh, are not the economy, in spite, and, and economists, believe it or not, do study a lot more than just the stock market. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, one reason why uh, the market has bounced back so rigorously uh, it vigorously is, is mainly because stock markets tend to be forward looking, right? So market participants are pricing in expectations of the future rather than what we are currently experiencing in the economy at the moment. And the expectations, as far as uh, I see it, uh, is that financial markets expect a kind of a one year uh, development timeline for the vaccine, consistent with what uh, Daryl has shared with us, uh, not just. Uh, you know, with, with, with the, the most uh, advanced efforts, not just in Singapore, but also in, in various other countries, including China. But nevertheless, uh, that, that kind of a not too hot, not too cold Goldilocks uh, scenario does require stock market, uh, does require the vaccine, not just to be made available, but to be made widely available 
and roll out uh, relatively quickly uh, with easy access. And that remains an open question, which is why the market, um, in my view, is actually a little bit fragile. Now that said, uh, markets are efficient. And if you look at the, the way that um, the, the kind of industries, the, the kind of stocks that have been most affected, you see that the ones you might expect, which is commercial and travel and banks and oil and gas, these are the ones that have contracted the most uh, as a result of the crisis. But be that as it may, uh, if you did not choose to sell uh, sometime in March, uh, you would have your 401k uh, would, would still be in place, uh, mainly because financial markets have more than recovered, have more or less recovered uh, from, from their there are contractions for the year. Year-to-date returns are actually absolutely fine. Uh, it's, it's weak, but it's absolutely fine for a, a recessionary scenario in the US. Uh, it's actually, the, the best performing market globally actually is China. Uh, if you had exposure to China, you would have done much better, but that's also consistent with their relative success in dealing with COVID. So again, I mentioned financial markets are forward looking. The other thing you may have noticed if you are financing a mortgage is that interest rates have also fallen. Stock markets actually price in uh, interest rate factors. I, I won't go into the details, but the idea is just that when interest rates are low, uh, valuations for stock markets tend to be high. And you, we, since interest rates have fallen in anticipation of, uh, of the recession that is playing out in the US, it's unsurprising that equity valuations are also high. Um, and the last thing is that markets also, as you may know, move according to several behavioral constructs. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the caveat here is that if vaccine development expectations uh, are dashed in whatever fashion because they don't end up playing out as quickly as we would like it to, uh, then we might expect uh, a harsher market reaction sometime in the future. So what are exit ramps? And, and this is relevant not just in the US, uh, but it's also in Singapore. And I think, uh, you know, we, we are Kiasu nation, so we uh, tend to be more guarded about each one of these exit ramp policies, certainly less gung-ho than, than some southern states in the US uh, have uh, approached this idea of reopening. Uh, the idea is to have, as I mentioned earlier, on widespread, affordable uh, and effective and importantly, self-administered testing capability, right? I mean, the, the, until you have, you know, people able to do these things like, like you know, a, a pregnancy test, a home pregnancy test kit, um, when you have to exit and, 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 and there is a much more of a travel cost and transactions cost involved in testing yourself, most people will not actually uh, end up getting tested. Um, of course, if you don't test, you don't have cases, and maybe if you believe you're... Uh, you know, the US president, um, maybe there isn't a problem, but we'll see. So, um, expect you know, th th there is inevitably there's going to be new waves that will arrive. And, 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 you know, the new waves, as I alluded to earlier on in the presentation, need not be, uh, uh, need not have resulted from outbreaks within your country, right? They could be imported. And as long as you have uh, countries that are still fit in the, the midst of, uh, the, the nadirs of their outbreaks, you will inevitably uh, have the possibility of, of importing cases. You know, one example is Vietnam, um, our neighbor to the north. They, they were very, very stringent about this. And then what happened was, um, was it Vietnam? Yeah, I think they, they had an Egyptian official, uh, official uh, come and, um, you know, he was supposed to do his kind of stay at home, stay in hotel and all this. And he went out to the, to the mall just to check things out. And uh, he was, of course, um, he was unfortunately positive. And so, you know, it just takes one spreader. Uh, it, Singapore the, didn't have a, as, much, as long a shutdown. And schools have now, as you know, reopened. Uh, but it, it may turn out that the way to do this is to have, um, you know, especially the high-risk individuals. In, in Singapore, it is the, the quarantine ones, foreign workers in dormitories. But in, in many countries, it may turn out to be uh, the aged, the agent, right? So, you know, those who are 65 and basically uh, those who have retired, uh, to have them stay at home, to remain in some kind of quarantine, to provide services, to uh, be able to deliver to these people, um, you know, groceries and the like, and then, and then reopen the rest of the economy much more aggressively. Even schools, uh, there's, there's some evidence that, um, 
very, very young children, so not, not so much uh, secondary school age, but primary school age, uh, they are not only less susceptible, but also they tend to be weaker vectors uh, of, of the virus. So, so some of these kind of much more customized and targeted reopening policies uh, may be in place. Um, you know, obviously, mass uh, Singapore belatedly came to this, but I, th I think it's uh, undeniable that at least in our context, it has worked out. Uh, people do, t do wear masks, and I think that has definitely helped to contain uh, some of the most egregious uh, spreads. Uh, even, you know, if you go to, I hate to say it, if you go to, go to Robertson Key, which came into notoriety recently, you still see big crowds. Uh, but uh, thankfully, uh, they are they are all masked up and and they do sit in groups of five. So, um, but there are there are many people at Robertson and Key and Boat Key and the like. Okay, um, I'm going to wrap up with some kind of implications. So uh, you may have heard of some of these, the deglobalization trend, uh, which was uh, already underway prior to. COVID-19, that looks like it could accelerate, right? Countries start to shrink their supply chains. Countries start to look at, um, you know, the possibility that they may reshore some of what, what, what used to be an export-oriented uh, policy toward, uh, toward growth may, may start to shift toward a, a more import uh, or a substitution model. And in, in, unfortunately, inequality, which uh, was very real, prior to uh, the crisis may become more exacerbated. It's exacerbated both in terms of uh, whether skilled workers will be hit harder or also uh, in terms of lost education, right? So often what you see is that it is the poorest households uh, that cannot afford to have, you know, the kind of supplementary education either by their parents or by tutors to make up for uh, the loss primary education that they were originally receiving uh, by, the, by the formal schooling system. And then uh, one thing that people often think about is in terms of work from home arrangements and whether, you know, we're now in a whole new world where um, cities will become a lot less relevant. If you guys are working in tech, you probably are uh, at the forefront of thinking about that rejiggering of uh, the organization of uh, economies. Uh, the, the caveat I'll point out here is that uh, you may be surprised at the resilience of cities in general, right? Um, so here, th this is an old study, is dates to uh, the beginning of the 2000s, but uh, basically they looked at two major cities in uh, Japan after the Second World War um, and looked at whether they were going to, uh, you know, Remember, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they were both bombed uh, with nuclear bombs, right? Um, you would think that then it really doesn't make sense to go back to a fallout zone and rebuild in those cities. Uh, as it turns out, uh, by, you know, about 10 or 15 years after those, uh, those, those bombings, uh, those cities have completely recovered their original pre-war trends in terms of growth. So uh, there is something, you know, it, agglomerations into cities did not occur uh, by accident. And so uh, there, there is a certain persistence to cities and spillover effects that come from uh, operating in cities that are ex extremely attractive. Well, you know, that's why you guys are in Silicon Valley, uh, not just uh, distributed everywhere else in the US, despite the fact that uh, the nature of your jobs do allow you to be uh, distributed. So I, I think we shouldn't rule out the staying power cities and the bottom line is that if you invested in San Francisco real estate, maybe just hold on to that instead of uh, selling out quite yet. Um, Jazz, was, I, I see she has Bay Area real estate, right? So, so, so she's uh, in a good position there. Don't sell. Um, not yet. Wait for global warming and flooding and then, then you have to worry about, about long-term uh, viability. And then, so post-COVID future in Singapore, I think uh, you know, you've heard this kind of ad infinitum, with every crisis comes opportunity. So I will mention that there are going to be some changes, especially for Singapore's growth model and economic model in the past. For instance, trade, which had been such a lifeblood in our economy, uh, will be affected. I mentioned how this uh, could be affected, especially in terms of our entrepreneurial uh, status. It was already under threat even prior to uh, the this COVID crisis and and I, I feel that we can no longer rely on this at least in terms of the traditional model of trade in, in goods 
uh, maybe what it requires us to then do is to transition much more into uh, the tradability of our services. We have begun this, uh, but we are, I would say, um, objectively a little behind how far Hong Kong uh, is in terms of ensuring the tradability of their services sector, right? And they obviously have uh, the movie industry, which uh, has been trading um, uh, for a long time, but also, uh, so obviously tourism is a tradable service, but, but other tradable services like medical, uh, like logistical uh, and, and legal headquarters services, those, those can are tradable in many ways. And, and so it's important that we ensure that uh, we, we push into these tradable services sectors. Uh, finance, uh, you know, Singapore traditionally was a global financial center, but a lot of what we did was back end, um, back end kind of uh, what's sometimes called back office financial intermediation, even investment banking. And my sense is that this will shift much more toward understanding uh, asset allocations worldwide, efficient asset allocation. And Singapore has, uh, to its credit, moved in this direction already. In the past 10 years, we are now one of the bigger global wealth management centers, and we will have to devote more of our uh, resources in terms of managing international finance toward this kind of new asset allocation role, front office role, rather than a back office support role, and, and let uh, the Indias of the world work on that. Uh, migration tourism, obviously, those will be hit hard, who knows, uh, but that you know, there is an insatiable uh, desire for many people to travel. If you guys have gone for staycations, you will understand, uh, Singaporeans also understand this, of course, you know, how small Singapore is. Uh, but if there is one opportunity there is to recognize that our model, which relied uh, very much, our growth model, which relied very much on low wage workers to substitute for you know, either uh, capital investment or importantly productivity led growth, that has to shift. And that's gonna be a painful shift because we have been trying to do this for a long time. But in a sense, uh, this is one of those areas where I feel if you kind of cut off uh, more, you know, it's, it's kind of a bit of a cold turkey concept. If you cut off uh, those flows, uh, in a more decisive fashion, it may spur uh, more rationalization toward productivity in that growth. And then finally, obviously, uh, you know, I don't have to preach to you guys working in, in the Bay Area that information and knowledge uh, will be supercharged, but even the nature of this uh, will shift, right? Traditionally, Singapore relied on ICT um, and, and even coding, and I think the future will move away a lot from that. Uh, the, the, you know, fourth industrial revolution, if anything, has much more to do with application of algorithms, uh, big data analysis and crunching. Um, and likewise, biotech is likely, you know, it's hard to see it now, especially in the midst of a COVID crisis. Uh, but I, I, I do believe that the trends there will move from kind of big pharma and into much more customized medicine, right? So uh, working with big data genetic uh, analysis of, of genetic um, individual genetic uh, codes and the like. So I think that, yes, that is my last slide. So I'll stop there. Uh, I think Jazz will... will yeah, I, thank you so much, Seamus, for coming on and sharing this very well thought presentation. I think you could see from Jazz's expression, we were just studying the slides intently because there was a lot of deep thought and detail in there. I also love how you presented the data. I do remember from my limited econ classes that it's about the scarcity of resources that has to be allocated. And thinking on one of your slides, you said how Singapore did the foreign workers um, and how you do age-based uh, discrimination. I recall that Singapore said they put more the, the elderly, the older foreign workers and those with pre-existing conditions extracted that could be more uh, severely affected if they were infected. Uh, they quarantined those and put more isolation because they couldn't afford to do that for every single worker to support in the resources for that. And so I think as a result, it led to maybe possibly more infections total, but less deaths and, and ICU you know, hospitalization, which, mm. which hopefully strikes me as a health and economics-ish kind of you know, approach to, to trading things off, which does really show how economics is, is, is a field that, that encompasses all of life. It's not just a mathematical model. Yes, and not just. Yes. Jess and I have been looking at the very extensive and um, interesting set of questions. Jess, if you could, uh, James, if you mind, we'll switch the screen. Uh, I've tried to summarize or, or pick uh, some of the questions uh, that I would like to ask you 
and certainly feel free to comment on more or less uh, being able to have a very limited time. So let me just get to it. I bolded uh, the first question, uh, perhaps because it's a bit of a before and now and after question future. How does this economic shock compare to prior historical events? Is it unprecedented in any way? Is it perhaps because the world is more interconnected today globally? And then forward looking, is there a roadmap, you know, perhaps based on the past for recovery? Yeah, so I think um, it's tempting for us, especially if you're a student of history, you know that there's this uh, tendency called presentism where we interpret the past from our lens and we always think we are unique and different, right? And, and, and um, to be fair, the, the 18, 19, uh, 1918 pandemic, uh, which occurred right at the end, tail end of the Second World War, was very, very different. And in fact, the world economy was at that time uh, also extremely connected. In fact, uh, the world until the First World War was uh, going through uh, one of its major phases of globalization. So financial flows were not as integrated, but definitely um, uh, trade flows were very, very integrated. So I wouldn't say that this is entirely unprecedented. Uh, what is true, of course, is that the numbers are now much larger. Uh, just in, th in terms of the denominator, right? There's just more people in the world now and more goods and, and so on and so forth. So I, in, in that sense, I'm not so concerned about whether the world will pull through this, the world will uh, pull through this. Um, the, the, I, I think the big difference, of course, is that we actually have more tools to manage uh, this better, both from the health, the epidemiological front, as well as the economic front, right? So we better understand uh, how to stimulate the economy and how to support the economy. And I think policymakers worldwide uh, have often done this to the extent that there are countries that don't choose to do this. It's not so much lack of understanding as much as uh, either political calculations or just uh, actually even a possibly a, a rational economic calculation that it just would be much more devastating for the economy uh, if or for, for people if they shut down the economy entirely than uh, then if they just let it go and let certain segments of the population have to deal with uh, having a health crisis. So mm -hmm. the roadmap for recovery, the, it, it, it exists. Uh, the big challenge is how uh, prolonged this recession will be. And uh, I think I've shared my views there already. I right. think that will be uh, more like a 90 switch shape possible. Cool. I think it's exactly so this is a more uh, specific question about with Western countries borrowing to support their population during this COVID season, how would this benefit Asian countries who essentially recover quickly, might be an assumption, and didn't have to issue as many uh, or many economic grants to help its people? Well, so we should be clear about what it means, what we mean by Asian countries, right? So uh, Japan actually had uh, went into very, very large borrowings. So of course, Japan is a bit unique in that it has a very, very large uh, public debt burden, but a lot of it is owed to itself because it also has very, very high uh, historical saving and hence it has um, this huge net foreign asset. So it, in some ways in Japan, it's a transfer from the private uh, savers, the private sector into uh, the public sector debt burden. So, uh, so again, different Asian countries are there, you know, developing Asia, uh, they didn't have as much room in terms of building up debt. They generally cannot uh, because um, they, they tend to face higher interest rates when they try to borrow from markets. But what they have done uh, is they have been a lot more willing, given low inflation worldwide, uh, to experiment with the possibility of debt monetization, which is basically, to put it in crude terms, printing money to finance uh, borrowing by their governments. And whether this leads to an outbreak of inflation um, I would be most worried about that happening, taking hold in developing countries rather than in advanced. So economies. would that include uh, those Latin American countries? If you talk about yes, that, especially Mexico. if you know Latin America has a history of uh, combating uh, inflationary pressures. So in the 1980s, especially even the 1990s for certain economies like Brazil. So it, you, I think uh, you, one must be very circumspect about um, financing um, it you know, kind of the, the COVID-related uh, debt in the same way that Western countries are able to do so simply because uh, their borrowing is generally regarded as a lot safer. So they don't face the same kind of interest rate pressures uh, that would break out if it turns out that um, they ended up printing money. If anything, actually, especially Europe, 
uh, they could do with a little bout of uh, inflation because they have been working with low and disinflationary pressures for so long. So this, this sounds like it may not really be a complete benefit because there's a pro and con that some may not actually recover. Asian, Asian countries may not necessarily recover quicker than Western countries. No, well, um, I, I think they, well, health-wise, uh, they, they have definitely had less of a hit uh, than Western countries. That's, I think, undeniable. Um, whether that plays out into the future in terms of how the economies perform, uh, that, that's really an open question because Asian economies are also a lot more open and rely a lot more on external demand rather than internal demand to drive, right? So Korea, for example, never had, um, as you know, they have had some isolated uh, clusters here and there, but they never had the same kind of numbers for a large population uh, as you see in some Western uh, countries in Europe. But nevertheless, uh, their economy has been hit really hard because they rely so much on exports. Um, so, and, and that's not uh, that easy to square. Right, right. Cool. Let me move to the next slide uh, topic, Jasmine. Actually, Thank before you, we, we do that, let's talk a little bit about the factors that will enable economy okay. to recover more quickly. Mm, so the we, last question? Yeah, the second to last. So that's the, is it faster digital transformation or reskilling? Are there certain sectors and things, levers that we, we should be looking into or investing more in to be successful? So I think every economy will have to think about their own uh, specific model. Mm -hmm. uh, I alluded a little bit to, I'll, I'll focus on Singapore because we're all Singaporean. I guess we care most about that. Um, I think that in the immediate aftermath, what the government did was exactly spot on, which was you want to make sure that there's no implosion of the economy, right? So you're pushing money out the door uh, in order to ensure that there isn't a complete collapse of the economy. Now, whether that could have been better targeted, that becomes an open question and open to the deba debate. I personally think it could have been better targeted, but the speed uh, in which uh, this money had to be rolled out and the kind of more broad uh, ease of access to this money, that, that I, I agree, that, that had to happen uh, when you lock down the economy in, in the fashion that we did. Now, uh, in terms of what that means in the medium run, um, you know, you, what you'd like to see, of course, is um, a recovery in jobs and then people going into these, returning to these jobs. I think that um, some, because some of these sectors will be permanently hit, especially in in travel and transportation, uh, it is in fact an opportune time uh, to reallocate some of our workers into different jobs, but not just about reallocation. And this is the part that we haven't quite gotten uh, down in Singapore yet, which is we have to be a lot more open to creating jobs ourselves. So we, as an economy, we don't have a large SME sector. We don't have as much support for entrepreneurship uh, and I think if we redirected some of our resources away from just keeping existing jobs uh, alive and toward helping with, uh, and not just about reskilling, because the idea of reskilling uh, is premised on A, us being able to identify what we need to reskill into and, and, and that, that, that match exists. So that still relies in a way on um, some aggregator, right, to do that match. You know, if there is a jobs board, I think the evidence on that is pretty mixed. It's not clear that we are successfully uh, channeling those that have reskilled into new job opportunities. I think it is much better if we change the Singaporean mindset away from just purely about um, getting a job. Of course, there are, there are always, there's going to be always going to be a segment of the population that does that. But to the extent that we can shift more and more of our young population, of our hungry population uh, toward creating new industries and opportunities like what you see in the Bay Area um, and, and fund, fund that with uh, either private or you know, public-private partnerships in terms of venture capital, uh, I think we'll, we'll be much better in terms of then creating the kind of um, future sectors that we need. And, and, you know, the more decentralized this process is, the more initiative an individual is willing to take in creating these jobs, I think the better off we'll be. And of course, it's easier said than done, but 
Um, my, my impression is that it shouldn't just be about creation, uh, keeping and creation of, of, um, of jobs within existing sectors, but rather the creation of new jobs. Yeah, I think it's, we, I agree with you. I think this shift is, is happening so quickly, right? That it's, you know, we have to start looking ahead to see where the puck's going, um, you know, in order to, to really uh, be able to meet the needs of the future. So with that as well, right, there is going to be some people who might be left behind. And we had a, a question from uh, some of our participants here on what we expect the long-term economic ramifications might be on stratification, right, across the social classes. So I think we want to be careful. Uh, it's still not, okay, so the thing is that a lot of our um, upper middle and upper classes of um, workers, they are working in often derivative sectors. So sectors, you know, like, like um, kind of management or professional services that provide support services to more fundamental uh, production sectors. So why that matters is because some of these derivative sectors um, may have kept their jobs because uh, the effects of the shock hasn't fully worked its way through the entire economy, right? When, when, when you start to see a, a kind of more permanent contraction in uh, the output of certain of those first line, front line sectors, that may end up uh, being reflected in uh, some of these support sectors then seeing a reduction in their demand for services. Think about legal services, right? Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, if their businesses collapse, uh, you're not going to need that many lawyers. And you need lawyers to wind it up, and then after that, you're not going to need ongoing uh, legal services. So, I, so I, that's the, the caveat that starts us off. Uh, but I also alluded to, yes, of course, you will see certain social classes being hit relatively harder. And at least in Singapore, we don't have a lot of a social safety net uh, to help uh, those sectors, uh, workers in general, and, and, and especially those uh, who have, who may have lost their jobs. And, and again, what we have rolled out in terms of the um, pandemic recovery plan, crisis plan, uh, that absolutely has provided some of that support. But we don't, didn't have that in place, right? So. Um, you may have heard me talk in, in other contexts about uh, the importance of some of these things like minimum wage or redundancy insurance. And I think that uh, as a society, uh, Singapore is wealthy enough that we can uh, seriously consider these kinds of uh, broader social support. Uh, even, even setting a poverty line, uh, Singapore doesn't have an official poverty line. And, you know, it's hard to target and uplift uh, the poorest in our society when we don't actually define which are the poorest in our society officially, right? So that we can actually, there is an informal um, poverty line, but even that is very, very low. It's uh, for a household is 1,650. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if you've gone back to Singapore lately, but 1,600 isn't a lot of money for a household to live on every month. Um, compared that to, I think, the US poverty line is about four times that number. Mm -hmm. I think we're sensing also a digital divide. Those that have the ability to be part of the internet community can be a little bit ahead, while those who may not be able to do that, even in the U.S., for example, when we have online learning, a lot of students, some students actually in certain communities are not able to get access to the internet, and so they have difficulties even going to school, and that sets, you know, like a whole semester, right, of non-school and sets them behind um, academically, for example. So yeah, I yeah. think you see, you see a lot of that in the US. Uh, thankfully, in Singapore, uh, because of the digital nation initiatives and so on from the past, uh, we don't actually have, I think, uh, much of that problem. Of course, you have people who are more willing to have fast internet connections versus slow internet connections. But in general, I think um, we don't face the same kind of digital divide in other countries, unfortunately. That's, that's great. Well, that's great. So you know what, um, on that note, let's go into the Singapore economy a little bit more. Uh, specifically, what is the outlook for Singapore? Yeah, so that's a super open question. Um, I, I, I guess I already alluded to how I think it will be a slow recovery. And you know, that actually doesn't sound too bad, except that it's, uh, well, it doesn't sound good, but 
it's important to keep in mind that we used to always have V-shaped recoveries. Uh, that was always the, the, the nature, the, the, a function of the fact that we had super open economy. So we had very, very sharp contractions, uh, sh much sharper than you might expect in, in, in numbers that you're more used to say in the US, right? In the US, if you have 4%, uh, 5% annualized contraction in GDP, that was considered uh, a, a big drop. In Singapore, you, you contract by 20%. Uh, but of course, then it will grow by 25% or 30% in the, the next quarter. So we always had these very, very sharp swings uh, in, in our economic um, activity because of our nature as a very, very open economy. Um, unfortunately, I think this time around, even if we do extract ourselves from the bottom, as, as I mentioned, we, we, I think we will, um, that, that kind of return to the original trend uh, looks to be not as not as forthcoming. So what I would like to see is, you know, even the idea of job creation and, and rejiggering people into growth sectors, having people create new jobs, that is unfortunately also a slow process. It will be better off as an economy in the long run when that finally happens. Uh, but that is not the kind of, you know, let's refill those jobs that that, that existed before the crisis. Uh, that's not the world that the outlook for Singapore that we will be facing. So okay. partially, you're almost answering the question in COVID terms, this 100 billion expenditure should not be on subsidizing what is, but investing in retraining and whatever it needs to mi migrate uh, the whole economy and the workforce to the future. Yeah, so I think, uh, to be fair, the, not all of it was uh, just about preserving existing jobs. And to also be fair, in the... In, in, the month of uh, April, when the economy essentially shut down, we needed that kind of, of support, right? Um, but yes, I do think that it, it would be prudent for us to at least uh, understand the efficacy with which, with which we shovel out $100 billion. Mm -hmm. um, so to know whether it went uh, to actually and and that's the thing like that we we hear anecdotal evidence for how uh, some of this support was a little more mixed and 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 the example is this so uh, they there was this job support scheme and that that uh, allowed employers to pay for make up for uh the salaries of the employers up to a certain percentage and then they'll be matched by the government right so th the problem with that was that um, a lot of these schemes operated on the premise that the employer was in the best position to decide on whether these um, support, this support should be granted directly to the staff or to saving the business. And in some instances, what you did, what you have heard is that, uh, you know, owners, business owners decide, well, I'm going to save the firm uh, over and above the jobs of the employees. Now, Actually, how would you compare this to the U.S. approach where I think many companies laid off quickly, but folks went on unemployment, they received their or stimulus checks uh, versus Singapore with that JSS? Yeah, so I, I think you don't want to go the full route. So the problem with the US system was that, well, firstly, the, the idea of going outright unemployed, um, that's very, very disruptive. Even if, if yeah, even if it's possible that you, you know that that's the system. And it was disruptive on two levels. It's disruptive both for the individual, but also for the states that have very, very antiquated uh, uh, unemployment insurance systems that were not able to cope with the surge. Uh, you know, you probably, you guys, again, being technical, you know that they were looking for COBOL programmers uh, at some point. Um, so, so obviously it's, it, it is not, it, I, I don't think the U.S. system of, of going full bore, uh, go unemployed, and then it would have been the best solution. Now that said, um, you know, I think the idea of a furlough would have been, uh, in, in some ways, uh, a little more positive. Now, a furlough, of course, uh, does imply that you don't have money. Uh, so if you allow uh, employers to furlough their workers, but then you directly provided the, the unemployment support to them through their bank accounts rather than through their firms, uh, I think that that may have been a, a little more egalitarian in terms of keeping workers um, uh, afloat while allowing firms that were not that efficient uh, to actually wind down rather than create kind of 
possibly promoting uh, the prospects of zombie firms. Yeah, uh, maybe it's a good segue to this question. You mentioned Kobo and tech, and the question I think it's seen both today, large tech companies are mostly using Singapore as a base of marketing sales, economies playing up of traditional SMEs, which deter Singaporean tech talent, uh, sufficient there from returning home. And can Singapore transition economy to be more tech driven? I, I guess it's not a pure economics question, or would you say it's, it, it's a lot more than that? Uh, yeah. what, what, what would it need? So I think I'll speak- Silicon Valley of Southeast Asia. Yeah, I'll speak to this, uh, both in the context of this question and, and something I saw uh, uh, in the latter slides about um, just a, a combination of coming home, right, to Singapore. Yes. What, we, what we ultimately want is to create a Singapore economy where you can come home. Um, and for a long time, why, I, I stayed away from Singapore for 20 years. And part of that was that there weren't opportunities for me to come home. Um, if I did come home, the, at least in, in, in my field in economics and finance, uh, the opportunities were still relatively limited compared to what uh, the palette that I could have elsewhere in the world. And that, I think, unfortunately remains the case, even though that has started to shift. And, and we are starting to see, at least in finance, uh, the, the kind of opportunities for high-skilled um, both tech and finance or biotech talent to return to Singapore. Uh, but it's slow. And until we have um, an entire ecosystem, right? And the ecosystem isn't just about, you know this, living in the Silicon Valley. The ecosystem isn't just about uh, whether you have people with skills. It's also about uh, having universities that have a pipeline for supporting innovation and then easily channeling. So this is the Berkeley and Stanford, right? Easily channeling these uh, people uh, into new startups. And then a VC scene, uh, that is not just a VC scene that, that, that is willing to uh, inject money into startups, but, but then uh, even a private equity scene that is much more developed. You say this is already happening with NUS, Blocks, anyone? And I think they are trying. Um, and this ultimately does come down to uh, understanding that we need to have a, a mindset shift among Singaporeans as well, young Singaporeans. I think they, they wish, uh, Sing young Singaporeans are able to see themselves as job creators, as idea generators, but we have to make sure that we also provide the ecosystem for them to succeed. And that it entails both the private sector, but also uh, if we believe that government plays a role in helping to uh, helping the genesis of these ideas, uh, we need uh, a government sector that is also much more willing to take risks. Um, I think on average right now, uh, the public sector is risk averse um, in, in many ways. And in some things you want them to be risk averse. Uh, I guess in managing COVID, you want them to be risk averse. Uh, but uh, when it comes to promoting uh, economic enterprise, I think, the more flexibility we grant at the highest levels, right? A lot of them it, it involves, it's not that the workers uh, in the front lines that are involved in selecting and pushing, um, pushing these grants are not able to do so, is that their KPIs often reward uh, the relatively safer uh, investment. So we have to be willing to say that at the highest levels, our KPIs aren't about year after year of modest uh, returns, but actually uh, looking for blockbusters, which is what the VC uh, sector in Silicon Valley does so well. And, and that means a willingness to invest, a willingness to invest in the possibility of failure and not being punished uh, by one or two failures, uh, but instead recognizing that we, we can, you know, the big blockbuster, is much more worthwhile supporting than a whole bunch of mediocre uh, but stable firms. With the di thank you, Jameis. With the digital transformation revolution happening as a result of COVID-19 and we're all working from home, do you think that helps you know, flatten the world in that sense and provide us more um, access to each other in terms of US Singaporeans working in Singapore and Singaporeans accessing the U.S. economy, for example. 
And so I think we, have, we struggle with internationalization. That's why Enterprise Singapore was formed, but it never had the same kind of traction. Uh, but I think those are both related. They, both enterprise, the, 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 the lack of willingness to go abroad and the lack of an ability to um, seize opportunities within um, Singapore uh, to create new business ventures in Singapore, they, they both stem from the same mindset that it's uh, of, of looking for, you know, something safe. Um, and, and, you know, in some ways, you cannot, you cannot always put the blame on our workers. Life is hard in Singapore. There isn't the safety net to fall back on when you, are, when, when you were to fail. Uh, you cannot afford to have to be out of a job when your children are in school and, and you are trying to make ends meet. So it, I think um, because of this, you know, our Kiasu culture has certain benefits, but it also has uh, certain costs when it comes to embracing uh, risk taking. And of course, it's not going to happen overnight, but I feel that the more we can promote small and medium enterprises to take the, the kind of entrepreneurial risk that, you know, it's not that, it's not that Singaporeans cannot engage in cre business creation, right? We, we have firms, we have many firms, but the thing is, I think you see a lot of small and medium enterprises, what are they doing? They are engaged in trading enterprises. So what they do, they bring a good in, a wine or some Taobao good from abroad, they repackage, charge a markup, and they resell it in Singapore at a higher price. That's not business creation. I mean, that's, entre that's ultimately entrepreneurial trading, um, which we do very well as an economy, but for the future, we can no longer rely on, on individuals that, that just do that. We need our businesses to go beyond just uh, a kind of value added marginal value added through trading. We need, we need um, to be creating the businesses and the, the, the goods that the rest of the wants, world wants to buy in the future. That's actually a great, uh, thank you, James. And also services, I believe then. Yeah, service, yeah, goods and services. So how do you think overseas Singaporeans like us, you know, how can we help what's happening in Singapore and how can we stay relevant to Singapore? Um, well, I, I do think the onus is a bit on us uh, in, as policymakers um, to create an environment where you guys want to come home, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, the better that environment we can create, the more we can create a virtuous cycle where um, overseas Singaporeans, they have proven metal come home and then feel comfortable at home because they have gotten used to certain mindsets uh, for openness and debate and uh, argumentation that, that they have become accustomed to having lived abroad. Uh, so we need to have a more vibrant national conversation about um, what works and what doesn't in our country. So I, I like that at least um, in the recent general election, we had more of that national conversation. I'd like to see that happen uh, in all fora, right? It, it, not just during election time, but to have a, a constant debate about uh, policies for our country. Because the more we get involved, even if, if you disagree with a given policy that I support or, or, or I disagree with something you support, the, the conversation and the debate, I think, is, is really important. Because I think the solutions that we will have to identify as a society uh, in, the few, in the 21st century are not uh, the kind of solutions that we could simply import from the rest of the world when we were still in a development phase. We need to think of um, the kind of trade-offs and it, it will involve trade-offs. So we need to be clear about what these trade-offs are and we need to not be afraid to recognize that trade-offs have to exist, that failure is possible, but um, as long as we are able to pick ourselves up from this failure, uh, we shouldn't um, rule someone out because of failure. There, should, there has to be more, um, more paths toward getting to the end goal than the, the kind of path that we have become so accustomed to, in, even in our educational system. You know, you do a six years primary school, uh, O level, A level, and then university, there has to be a recognition that that path, that standard path um, 
is works for some people, but it doesn't work for others. And there's no reason that these other people that it doesn't work for cannot actually become uh, important contributors to society. Got it. Thanks, James. So it's that little bit of a social stigma related to people with different pathways in Singapore um, coming back in as well. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So how did you, how did you plan and execute your move to Singapore? Yeah, do we want to uh, switch, switch to the next slide? I think, yeah, it was yeah. great thought, Jess. I thought we just like, the thought, I don't know how much uh, we'll, we'll get on, on this is more of a personal thing. Like, uh, we also had a um, well, favorite economist. <laughs> I, I gradually moved east. So I, I first uh, went, and you, you know, you, my, my wife, she is American, um, used to American freedom. So first I softened her up by moving to Abu Dhabi. Uh, where, <laughs> Where, where, where she has absolutely no, well, okay, that's no, not true. No freedom. What? Uh, that's like the other extreme. Yeah, well, but, but we did live in Abu Dhabi for three and a half years. It's better use uh, of the weather, uh, the hot part of it. Uh, it actually, so for, if, for those of us that are familiar with that part of the world, it is very, very hot in the summer, much hotter than Singapore is. Uh, although you wouldn't know it in the air-conditioned offices because, of course, energy is very cheap there as well. Uh, but in the wintertime, it's very pleasant. It, it's like Hong Kong. So you have uh, between 14 and 18 degree days um, in, in the winter time, which lasts for about two to three months. So uh, it's actually quite pleasant uh, in, in the winter time. If the weather were like that throughout the year, uh, many people wouldn't want to leave uh, the Middle East. Um, now, so in, in terms of planning, I think you, you well, you have, to make, you, you have to make choices. For me, I switched. Uh, industries, right? I was in finance. Uh, I was able to save up a little bit uh, when, when I was working in the financial sector in Abu Dhabi. Uh, so much so that when I came back to Singapore, I was able to take a pay cut. So I took about 60 plus percent pay cut uh, to return to Singapore. Wow. Um, part of that was not just the headline numbers. I, um, I also moved into academia, which tends to pay less in general. Uh, but part of it is that uh, I, I, you know, my mother had retired and I, I wanted to spend, you know, I had been away for 20 years, right? So uh, my sister had borne the brunt of uh, taking care of mom. So now it's my turn to pay the dues, if you will. Uh, so really, it, it was a, a combination of um, family circumstances and and making sure that you had some of your ducks lined up financially, at least for me, uh, before I returned to Singapore, and 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 a business opportunity and, and a, a job opportunity before I moved back as well. Um, yeah, so I definitely didn't come back. It's actually looking. validated. We had a seminar or forum earlier on jobs in Singapore, and the speaker, I think, basically said, I recall, you probably won't find the same pay as you get in Silicon Valley, and probably not the same class of job, especially if you were in like a big tech company that doesn't have the same global and all that, but you will find a good job, he assured those overseas Singaporeans on the call, I mean, especially in Silicon Valley Bay Area. So, it so well, seems like you're validating that, that observation from, from the consult, you know, the job consultancy guy. Yes, but I also want to move us beyond that, right, to where we no longer have to worry about taking a pay cut when we, that's when you got guys will come back to Singapore. Mm -hmm. When you don't feel that like you're sacrificing, you feel you're sacrificing Californian weather and lifestyle, uh, but not salary. Uh, if we can't even um, attract in terms of salary, uh, then something is missing here. You know, it's not, the food just isn't good enough uh, to get you guys back. Um, Yes, although I, I will have, I'll probably go eat some chak kway tiao for lunch. Um, sorry about that, reminding you about that. Don't, yeah, don't rub it in, Jameis. Um, but having said that, I think we're all feeling it though, the whole work from home scenario and the concern that uh, with companies now being able to hire everywhere that our salaries will be impacted. So that could anyway be the status quo moving forward. What do you think about that? Um, Yes, although I think ultimately, um, that, that was always going to be a concern, I guess. Uh, you can always imagine that there, are, there is an opportunity to hire someone from a different part of the world. Uh, 
that would be willing to accept a lower salary. I think it's important to understand that wages isn't just about cost of living. Uh, it's also a big function of productivity, right? That's why you don't always hire the cheapest person uh, available because they, they may be cheaper, but they may not be as productive. It's, a, it's a, an interplay between uh, productivity and, and quality versus uh, just raw cost. And, and I think the more we can move and advance the proposition that what we bring to the table is value and quality, and I think we are not there yet. I think as a country, as workers in Singapore, we are not there yet. We are viewed as very reliable workers, mm -hmm. um, but we're, you know, reliable workers get paid reliable salaries, but not uh, star salaries because we are not uh, not quite yet the kind of star workers, right? The star workers that we have, they, they go to Silicon Valley and then they don't come back uh, like you guys. So, so what we have to do is we have to uh, make sure that those among us uh, that go through the system, they can, they also strive to think outside the box. They strive to be producers uh, and not just um, workers. You know, they, they don't fall, fall in line with someone's vision. So I, I guess it does come down to the entire pipeline. If you are, we have to encourage out of the box thinking, challenging uh, rote learning and, and model answers in uh, the, at the earliest levels, uh, mm -hmm. so that we 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 carry this into our future. Uh, that when we become workers, we are also the ones that challenge conventional wisdom. That those are the people that end up uh, earning um, the big bucks, not the ones that can execute well. You know, an operator does well and up to a point, and then beyond that, you know, you're just an operator. Mm -hmm. That's definitely inspirational. I think that applies everywhere. Great. I love that insight. You know, we're running out of time here, Jameis, but I can see all the questions coming through. People are getting all warmed up, but we do have to say bye, um, you know, because we have, I mean, this has been- You have your chocolate yes, yeah. that, that You're looking forward to. Um, so one more question, if we could, a little bit of insight. Who's your favorite economist? Um, so- And why? I'm, I'm gonna uh, give it this satisfaction. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, because I, I wouldn't say that I have uh, a favorite economist or any favorite personality. Uh, I, even with someone um, that I may disagree 90% of the time with, I think that 10% of the time they have an insight that is valuable. So I will want to learn from that person 10% of the time and, 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 and take their views into what I, I believe in. So by the same token, I have uh, favorite economists in different uh, areas of economics, you know, and I'm, I could cite them, but it's going to be obscure, right? So Alan Drazen, who's a great uh, political economist, it, many people haven't heard of uh, in terms of international in economics, Maury Oxford, who actually is at Berkeley. Uh, he's great. And again, most people haven't heard of him. Uh, so it's, I have favorite economists that come from different areas, but I, I think the more meta point that is relevant here is that you don't want to have just one person that you draw all your ideas and inspiration from. You, you want to be as much of a sponge in aggregating ideas that come from everyone, even those you disagree with, uh, because that makes you um, both reflect on, on your own positions, but also uh, it, it, it makes you a more well-rounded thinker when you, when you approach uh, ideas. So, you know, again, I don't have a single favorite uh, economist, but uh, so, again, sorry to disappoint uh, in terms of that. Uh, I, yeah, but, but uh, I, I would say I have favorite of, of various times. I even have many, many different favorite music musicians that I like, you know. Um, really? So, Who would they be then? Um, so, so I, I'm dating myself, but uh, obviously I like Bon Jovi, right? Um, but I also like Nigel Kennedy, who's a violinist uh, mm -hmm. that plays um, that, that plays in a kind of unconventional, vigorous style. Mm -hmm. uh, I like Yo-Yo Ma. Mm -hmm. um, I like Ella Fitzgerald, and so I like jazz. So I like Ella Fitzgerald and and um, and Louis Armstrong. So again, that's. Yep. I don't have a single 
favorite thing. It, it ranges the range, right? Because um, I, I, I try to be eclectic in in, under, in recognizing that, that there are there is excellence in every pocket that you can imagine uh, with even within a field like like music. So by the same token, um, I like to think that there, there's excellence in all men, all, all, all types of Singaporeans. And so we don't want this single path where, you know, we select only in, in one definition of success. I would like to see Singaporeans uh, of all um, types be able to find success uh, and, and excel, right? Become uh, globally excellent in their own ways. And, and unfortunately, I think at the moment, we still haven't got, gotten there. We are still uh, relatively narrow in, in the kind of uh, uh, Singaporeans that we tend to celebrate. Got it. I think we all share, a lot of us share that view as well in terms of diversity of thought that we appreciate, right? Um, across not just the economies that we prefer as well as music too. But I have to say, I think uh, from this session, James, you're fast becoming one of our favorite economists with the, with the insights that you shared with us today. So thank you very much for your time and uh, inspiring us really to, you know, perhaps go back to Singapore to contribute, right, in different ways as well, because I think that's also brave. I mean, the bravest we've done so far is make a video as a group. Um, and as we go back, as we go back to think of what we can do in Singapore, I think that sounds uh, super exciting. Um, uh, you know, in terms of your journey ahead. So we look forward to uh, all that you, you know, you're doing out there and certainly are um, excited about uh, you, about, you know, what you're doing out there for Singapore too. So Please. with that, yeah, with that, I'd like to just uh, see if you have any other parting words, James, for us uh, out here in the Bay Area. Uh, well, definitely just stay safe. Uh, if you need to evacuate, evacuate. Uh, we need you guys alive so that you come back to Singapore uh, eventually and, and contribute to uh, out the country. I mean, I think there is some something about coming home, right? Uh, I think um, Kit Chan uh, said it well and, and so sang it well. And I think uh, we, the, the dream is that that decision to come back home um, becomes easier and easier because you you feel you have to sacrifice less and less uh, were you to do so. So hopefully we can aspire to uh, that kind of society where you would uh, make that move back because it's so much easier to do so. Well, thank you, Jameis. Really appreciate thank your you, time James. here. And Very Mark, much. anything else before we wrap up? Uh, thank you, Jameis. I'd also like to thank our community for sticking with us in Singapore Connect, uh, supporting each another, uh, giving us ideas on what to do. Uh, in fact, I think this session came from the feedback that we wanted an economics focused session. And I see in our Q&A there's some who really like to talk about, I think, going back to Singapore and how it, you know, the readjustment goes. And we have a community of people, former Singapore Connect uh, alums, in fact, if I think about it, who have gone back for reasons, I think, similar to yours sometimes, James, family reasons, kid reasons, education. So these are all ideas for topics. We want to stay relevant to all of you in our community, uh, knowing that in these times, we're probably not, you know, again, doing physical events. I'm sure we all love to do a tug of war. We all love to have a soccer match. But uh, right now, we, 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 I think, we're, as you said, this is a, going to be a long recovery, uh, probably also a long reopening and adjustment for uh, everyone getting back together. This doesn't mean it's a quick fix of a vaccine. Uh, and... And we, as a community, would do well to adjust, and reallocate, you know, learn new skills, so that when when the opportunity is right, we will be all stronger and and also more united together. So thank Great. you, everyone. Thank you, Dave, uh, David Hall. Thank you, um, MFA team with Daryl and and Hui Hui, for for also you know linking us together. Uh, I want to know if they have any also parting words. Daryl's out now, but maybe David? Hey, hello. Hey, thank you so much, Jasmine, Mark, and Jameis, for, for the very um, exciting presentation. I learned a lot from you guys today <laughs> about economics and about Singapore and COVID. Um, so there was a lot of talks about jobs and going back home and uh, uh, reacclimatizing with uh, what's happening back in Singapore, especially if you have been away for too long. So I think part of the, the reason why the Singapore Global Network was set up is really to help Singaporeans as well who are 
interested to go back, who are thinking of going back, we can help to connect you with the community, um, potentially your counterparts who are in similar positions back in Singapore, so that you have a better sense of, you know, in that particular sector, what, what is it like? Um, and in terms of salary, in terms of work, in terms of culture, and so on and so forth. So more than happy to, to um, reach out to each of you. I mean, if you have any um, concerns about questions about going back and climatizing and so on, feel free to reach out to, to me. Um, I mean, most of the chat groups, I assume that most of you got the information from the chat groups or from the Facebook groups. So just feel free to reach out. Happy to have that conversation with you. Yeah. And just to share, for example, next week we are having a FinTech event. So for those of you who are in FinTech, for example, I think this is one area that um, Jameis mentioned is up and coming. Um, it's doing very well in Singapore. A lot of good jobs are being created. So if you're interested to, to um, find out what are the opportunities there and get you some of the companies, um, I think it's a good event to, to go to as well. Great. Well, thank you very much, everyone. Let's uh, end the evening th uh, today. And once again, we want to thank our special speaker, uh, Jameis, as well as MFA and Singapore Global Network for participating in tonight's event. Night, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Stay safe, guys. Bye for now. Stay safe.